little short little video, of course, there on the background of uh, ancient Rome, of course, which we'll be talking a great bit about this week overall. So anyway, I want to welcome you all back. Of course, History 1113, Summer Edition, uh, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. So anyway, I hope you are having a great week out there. Uh, I know we had the 4th of July weekend, so I hope you caught some fireworks or shot some, <laughs> I guess, up in the air or whatever uh, for that time. So um, so anyway, yeah, yeah, um, of course, I'll get more into like talking about what we're going to do, of course, this week lecture-wise. Uh, with the Romans, but it looks like we've got a few students watching right now, apparently. Uh, we got Trey watching right now. Hey, what's going on? Uh, we had a great weekend overall. Jessica, hey again. Uh, Madison, uh, what's up? Uh, of course, and also Devin. So, hey, so I'm having a great 4th of July weekend uh, and all of that. So, uh, anyway, uh, if anybody wants to join me in StreamYard, by the way, there's the link to it uh, overall. Uh, of course, I will kind of get started and kind of give you some ideas of, you know, where we're at right now. Uh, of course, as you know, we're in week six uh, of the summer semester. So I hope you're keeping up, you know, with the class uh, and all that. Um, looks like we do have some assignments that are still out right now. Uh, I do have them up still. I don't know if you haven't seen that or not, but uh, I think there's that India quiz and the one on the Phoenicians, Israelites. Uh, that will be up till tonight. So I'm going to close it later. I think I left it open one more day. I know it says due yesterday, but I kind of left it open anyway. Because, you know, you had the 4th of July weekend and all that. So I decided to kind of, you know, leave that open. Uh, second exam, of course, will be due sometime, I think, by the upcoming weekend uh, as well. So that's our main things we've got pretty much due. Uh, that next vocab, which I think is the third one, is due next week. So I don't got too many weeks left. Uh, I think this week I'm concentrating on the Roman Empire. That's what I'm doing. And then... I guess next week, I'll mostly on week seven, the last week of lectures, I'll kind of try to do whatever I can on, uh, of course, the Middle Ages, which we covered a little bit on also uh, as well. So uh, if you have any uh, questions, you know, comments, you know, during the live stream, you know, let me know uh, about that uh, with the lecture. Uh, of course, if you have any comments, questions about a previous lecture, administrative thing, just uh, you can email me or leave comments, of course, on my channel. So uh, anyway, um, like I said, today uh, I'm going to, of course, be discussing, you know, the history of ancient Rome. I'll be mostly talking about the background of the Romans. I'll kind of get into like the Roman monarchy, so they usually traditionally call it. Um, and then I'll get into the Republic. We'll probably at least get half of that done today, uh, talking about the background of the Republic, at least up to the time of the Punic Wars. I'll get into that and discuss it. So um, if you have any comments, questions, of course, during the lecture, you know, like I said, let me know uh, any time. So um, you look at, of course, a map of the Roman Empire. It was pr pretty massive in size. Uh, the Roman Empire at one point, at least in ancient times, you know, was considered one of the largest, uh, I think, up through, I guess, the end of the, before the Middle Ages uh, actually came in. Uh, the Roman civilization, uh, it's kind of like a kind of a European civilization originally. It started in like a, uh, ancient Italy uh, a long time ago. Uh, you see where Rome is right there in the middle uh, and kind of grew. You can see spreading out through most of Europe, Eastern, Western Europe, predominantly Southern Europe. Uh, and then you can see it spread into like Asia at one point. South, Southwestern Asia mostly. And then, of course, into into North North Africa also as well. And um, yeah, comparison like between like the Achaemenid Empire, which was before and maybe Alexander's Empire, it's maybe like double that size uh, at one point. I think they say it may have had at 1.2 million square miles uh, that it controlled. I think the peak year was about 117 AD. Uh, I think when Emperor Trajan died uh, and um so, yeah, exceeding a population, I get various numbers on that, but 50 to maybe, I think I say at one point, I may have had 80 million people at one point that may have been part of the Roman Empire. So, yeah, it's large in size, uh, you're looking at there. Uh, but you can imagine, it started out as a small little state, you know, the kingdom, kingdom of Rome, I guess, Roman kingdom, uh, that was based in Italy. And um, 
Rome itself uh, is based around originally, I kind of have a map showing you, but they often call it the, Rome is called different names. Uh, they call it today sometimes the um, so-called the eternal city, that I guess has been around a long time. Uh, also the city of seven hills. That's been a common name that they've also called it uh, as well. Uh, you kind of see the new Roman form in the background. Well, the, I guess that new building back there, you can see where they, their, uh, their assemblies meet. But um, if you have a map here, looking at right here, you can see, yeah, Rome was founded around seven hills, uh, which you can see there. Uh, of course, based next to the Tiber River, which you can see is to the west of it. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, they think Rome was founded in the 8th century. At least that's the theory that they have from archaeology uh, and some of the Roman writers that write back then, uh, back in ancient times. Uh, and, of course, you see the one in the middle, uh, it's so-called Palatine Hill, is considered to be really the one that's the most famous overall, which is right here. But you see all the other ones, Avatine Hill, Capitoline, Celian Hill, Esquiline, Feminal Hill, Perennial Hill, of course, also right here. Uh, so those are all the different hills that Rome is uh, kind of based around. Uh, and um, hey, Gavin, good morning. Uh, also, uh, also there's a, uh, you know, they built like for fortifications around it too to protect the city, which you can see uh, the most famous was the Serbian wall, uh, which a lot of the later fortifications were built, especially by the Roman Empire uh, and all of that. Uh, you see the Vatican, so you can see, is over here across the river. So anyway, kind of, uh, and I think the Roman Forum, and I can't really see it in that map, but it's kind of located kind of in the middle between Capitoline and the Palatine Hill, kind of like right over here, that area. But um so, yeah, Rome, like I said, was founded around these so-called, you know, seven hills, uh, with, of course, the Palatine Hill being, you know, the most famous. Now, you may have heard about the story about um, Romulus and Remus, which I think the video kind of, little short video went into. You know, Romulus and Remus, they were considered the founders of Rome, especially Romulus, who later on went on to be uh, the first Roman kingdom, king they had, uh, and... Um, you know much about the story of Romulus and Remus. Supposedly they were descended from gods. Uh, their mother, uh, whose name was Rhea Silvia, was supposedly raped by the god Mars, and that's how they were actually conceived. Uh, and uh, they see they show a lot of images of usually Romulus and Remus with like a she-wolf, uh, which is kind of a famous story. I guess I'll kind of share with you uh, a little bit. But uh, according to legend, uh, they were actually the, uh, grandsons of a, a great king of Italy, like ancient Italy, uh, with the city of Alba Longa, uh, which went back a long way. And uh, King Numitor, um, th th their grandfather, uh, he, he, they had a, uh, he had a brother named uh, Amulius. Amulius. And Amulius wanted the throne, so he took the two twins and he basically threw them into the Tiber River, like floated them on a basket. It's kind of like the Moses story a little bit. Hoping they would drown, uh, but what supposedly happened was um, there was a she wolf that found them, and uh, later on, uh, a, a local like a royal shepherd, I think of I think of one of the king from the original of the king, uh, raised them to, to adulthood, uh, and so supposedly the uh, she wolf, I think I guess the, the two twins were able to suckle off of her teats, I guess, and survive until they were actually found, and so. It was considered to be like a miracle that, that they that they lived uh, and all that. So that's why they'll sometimes call it the Capitoline Wolf, I think is the common name that they'll usually call the wolf. And I think usually they'll see it without the two twins, but the twins, but uh, I think usually that one's got that with it, of course. So that's that's considered a very famous story uh, in Roman history. But a lot of a lot of early Roman history is really kind of a mix of like almost like history and maybe some mythology and uh, some of the early stories of I guess of early Rome might not be true. Uh, they think Romulus existed but they're not sure about the story about Romulus and Remus but um, they do know that the two quarrel. You know about this. Uh, they fought over the building of Rome later 
of how they were constructed in Romanus killed Remus. And then Romanus became the, the you know the king, first king of the Romans. And they say that Rome or, or the Romans was named after Romulus, uh, is the theory. All right, uh, let me also talk about uh, some other things about the early Roman history too as well. Uh, they had different writers. Uh, they were famous that wrote about early Roman history. I kind of got them right here, a list of them. But you've got Levy, also known as uh, Titus Levius. Uh, they called him uh, Plutarch. Uh, and then you've also got Virgil. So those three are kind of famous authors that are kind of well-known, that kind of write a lot about early Roman history. Uh, the one on the far left, uh, they usually call him Titus Levius, but on uh, the West, they just call him Levy for short. He wrote a, a series of books about Rome from its founding, uh, which they originally called Ab Urbe Condite Libre, which means, by the way, in Latin, from the founding of the, the books from the founding of the city. Um, so they go back to like, you know, when Rome was found in the eighth century. I think it covers up to like the time of Julius Caesar and uh, Augustus. Uh, so it's quite extensive. Uh, it took him, I forget how long it took him to write it, Levy. Uh, I think it was like 20, 30 years. And uh, at one point it had 142 books in it, but only 35 exist now. Uh, so like one fourth of the work is still around today. Uh, which I think the most famous part, if you know about this, of Levy's work is the one about Hannibal, you know, the war of Hannibal, uh, the so-called Punic Wars. And so Levy is a major source on the Punic Wars when Rome fought the Carthaginian Empire. Uh, then in the middle, uh, you've got another author that was real famous uh, named Plutarch, who's actually Greek. I mean, he's living in Roman times, but uh, Plutarch's got all kinds of books. Uh, he writes about the Greeks and the Romans. Like he wrote about Sparta, like on Sparta, if you know about that, uh, Plutarch. Uh, but he had a series of books that are usually just called The Lives or Parallel Lives. And he kind of goes into like a, the biographies of famous nobility. Uh, there are the Greeks and the Romans. And he became famous for kind of comparing them. Like he compared like, I think, Julius Caesar to like Alexander the Great because they were both great conquerors. But those are some of the examples of some of the people, you know, that, like he wrote about, that were famous. Romulus, of course, first king, Romans, Cornelius Sola, Gaius Marius, Gnaeus Pompey, the great, uh, Mark Antony, heard of him. Uh, if you want to know about Cleopatra, that's one of the, you know, biographies that tells you a lot about her. Uh, Julius Caesar, of course. He also got a biography on Brutus, you know, the guy that stabbed Julius Caesar and stuff like that. Uh, so there's numerous types of, you know, biographies that, uh, Plutarch writes, and Plutarch's a very influential writer. A lot of writers in the Middle Ages kind of copied him, like his format of writing and stuff like that. Uh, on the far right, I sometimes mention him. He's more of a poet. You've heard of Virgil, of course, the Roman poet. Uh, he's like one of the greatest poets up there with Ovid and other Roman poets that were well known. Uh, and um, he wrote the Aeneid, which is an epic, which was kind of a continuation of the uh, Homer, you know, Iliad, uh, you know, Homeric type, you know, uh, uh, epic poems they had before, kind of continues the uh, Trojan War. You know, it tells the story of Aeneas, uh, who was a cousin of King Priam uh, that escaped after the Greeks sacked, you know, Troy and all that. And uh, he eventually fled to Italy, uh, where he began to set up cities like Alba Longa I mentioned before, uh, was a supposedly a city he founded. Well, they say. Uh, and so the Romans actually believed that they were descendants uh, from from actually the Trojans, at least they, in theory anyway. And so a lot of Romans like Julius Caesar and other famous, you know, nobility actually traced their lineage back to Aeneas. At least they thought that. I think they thought Aeneas was also part God, you know, like Romus and Remus were also as well, which probably isn't true, but that's something that they, you know, they actually believed back then. Uh, also about early Roman history, too, like the Romans themselves are, are not really one people, like especially in Italy. They're kind of a mix of peoples. I think they kind of went into that and kind of talked about it a little bit. But um, mostly originally they, they were made up of people that were called the Latin peoples, uh, which were kind of living in like the central part of Italy. Uh, you also had the Etruscan peoples that were in northern Italy that lived in an area called Etruria, like they were talking about, or also called Tuscany you know, Tuscany uh, is today. Uh, so that area is kind of where they lived. And you had the Greeks 
uh, that were living in the South, uh, those, those, and also in Sicily. But from there, you know, the Roman people would, you know, expand to other parts of like Europe, North Africa, Asia. So uh, later, the Roman Empire is a multi ethnic empire made up of different peoples, nationalities, races, religions. Uh, and so it's kind of a melting pot, kind of like the United States later today, uh, as you know. So I'm not probably going to go into that, but that's something that's, you know, very true about, you know, uh, the Roman Empire. Like, like most empires, you know, are pretty much multi ethnic. Uh, you really study into it. Uh, I'm going to also kind of talk about today as well. I'm going to get into like the different periods of, of the Roman state, which um, really truthfully, uh, the first period you have, you're going to have this so-called monarchy that you're going to have uh, that comes in uh, at this point. Those, of course, the so-called seven Roman kings uh, that you're looking at. Rome was a monarchy for about 200 something years. So I'm not, not, not quite two and a half centuries, but you can see there, 753 to about 509 BC is the period. They call it different names. I think Roman monarchy, Roman kingdom. They call it the regal period, I think, was what they said in the video. So it's got all kinds of names that they usually dub it. Uh, here's a list of the kings, of course, you see there uh, that are well known. Uh, most of the kings, by the way, were not from the Latin peoples. I think uh, Romulus was supposed to be the only one descended. Uh, the other three, you can see here, Numa, Pompilius, Tullus, Hostilius, Ancus, Marcius, uh, they came from the Sabine tribes, which were nearby. Uh, that's a famous story, by the way, if you know about this, how Romulus went out with his men, and they actually populated the city with, with women from other tribes because they didn't have any, apparently. I think they sometimes call it the rape of the Sabine women. I think is another term they use, which the term rape is a kind of a term that the Romans kind of start using, which means to seize. So they went out and seized women and brought them back. Uh, that's a very famous by Jacques Louis David, uh, which depicts that. Uh, and so, yeah, he was able to populate, you know, the Roman state uh, and all that. Um, but yeah, the other kings they had too. Um, Tarkin, the elder, you see here. Servius, Tullius, Tarkin, the Proud, those were all Etruscan rulers, the Etruscans that lived up in the north. The Etruscans uh, went back further than the Romans. They supposed were older ancient people uh, that were there, which influenced the, the Romans a lot. Uh, and um, so it was kind of a mix of peoples you know, that were there. And the Roman kings were usually elected for life, you know, like most monarchs are usually for life until they die. Uh, then, of course, uh, also, you can see they had absolute power. Uh, they had like kind of an assembly, like a senate, like the Roman Senate, which was more like an advisory body to the kings. But the kings pretty much had the last say on pretty much what the policies would be uh, of the of the actual kingdom uh, and all that. And the word the word uh, imperium, which is kind of where you get the word imperial from, you know about that later. Uh, it's kind of a term meaning absolute power or power over others or it's so always say authority to, to have power over others. Uh, and um, one of the big symbols of Rome that you always see uh, that's well known uh, is the so-called fasci, uh, which has been around since ancient times. And uh, the fasci uh, is a um, Roman symbol of, of really of authority, of originally the kings and then later on, uh, the Roman state and military. Uh, usually it means bundle or bundle of rods because it's usually seen as this bundle of sticks or wooden rods uh, with, with an ax coming out of it. And uh, over time, if you know about it, uh, it was later borrowed in modern times by these right-wing politi political type dictators like Benito Mussolini and Hitler, etc., and so it became like a symbol of what they call fascism. It's where the word fascism came from, if you know about that today. Uh, but fascists are kind of been around. Like in, in the United States, you actually have them in the U.S. Congress building. They have them on the walls and all that. Uh, but originally, originally it was a symbol of Rome. Well, that's what it was. I guess later on the uh, modern times, like these Italians and German, like Hitler, Hitler and all that, kind of took it and used it for other things, I guess, for their movements. 
But, um, and of course, I did talk about the Capitoline wolf. I think that was another big symbol I think I mentioned before. I'd already mentioned uh, that was kind of a big symbol. I think those, the fasci and the Capitoline wolf were big symbols, of course, of the Romans. Now, like I said, uh, most of the, like I said, most of the Roman kings were descended, like from the Sabines uh, and the Etruscans. Uh, the, that last one, the Tarkin family, you're looking at right there. They ruled over 100 years, 616 to 510. They were in power uh, at one point. However, uh, under the last king, uh, Tarkin the Proud, also known as, by the way, Tarkin Superbus, as they called him, what happened was they had a, uh, he had a son, I think it was his youngest son, I believe it was, uh, raped a local woman named Lucretia. Uh, and it was a big uproar among the Roman people. And it, it created an incident that's very famous uh, in Roman history, which uh, they call it different names. Usually they call the Rape of Lucretia. It's what it's called usually. And uh, anyway, uh, he raped this woman, uh, and she later killed herself afterwards, committed suicide. Uh, it was made later into a famous painting in the uh, during the uh, Renaissance by Titian uh, in the 16th century called, I think it was the original name, of Tarkin and Lucretia. Uh, and uh, so what happened was it uh, sparked a uh, kind of like a revolution. You might call it a political revolution, which it may have been one of the first political revolutions in history maybe that happened, uh, you can say. Uh, and what they did was they overthrew the monarchy and they established a republic instead. Uh, and so that led to the founding of the Roman Republic, uh, which would last from like 509 B.C. Uh, to about 527, to, to about 27 B.C. So it lasted 480-something years uh, that it's round. And it went on to be founded by the relatives of Lucretia afterwards, like her uncle and her husband uh, were the ones that would eventually found it. Uh, they would actually all actually become later the first Roman consuls that would actually rule uh, the Roman state, uh, which were the heads of state that replaced the monarchs uh, and all that, especially uh, Lucius Junius uh, was the one uh, that's well known uh, for being very famous, one that started there, one of the main you know, founders of the Republic. Uh, and um, I think he's a descendant of the, the, of the Brutus we know that, that kills Julius Caesar, which is kind of ironic. Uh, so it's kind of a family that's been around quite a while. Hey, Tonica, hope you're having a great morning uh, out there overall. So yeah, that's that's a famous incident in Roman history that really leads to you know the beginning uh, of, of this new type of Roman state that'll eventually emerge. Now, of course, I'll get to it in a second. They often call it later the SPQR. That's, of course, the name for what they call the actual Roman state that's founded afterwards. Uh, Senatus Papus Romanus means the Senate and the Roman people. You want the translation of it. It's a common name for, for the actual government uh, that's put in power afterwards. But they also call that, they also use that for the Roman Empire. Uh, that'll be later. But the Roman Republic was a type of uh, government that was kind of influenced by the Greeks, uh, but it was more based on representative type democracy, which is what we have in the United States. We're not really a direct democracy, you know, about that. But a lot of the uh, people that controlled the state were mostly the wealthy peoples. They call later the patricians, I think, were the main group. Uh, that controlled the most. So in a sense, the Roman state was more like an oligarchy where you had the upper classes, you know, controlling everything, controlling all the land and so on. Uh, and so, but it was kind of deemed as this representative type of democracy, one of the first famous ones in the world. And it was around for a long time. Uh, it was around, I think they say the Roman Republic was around for like 482 years, about and then the Roman Empire was around for like 500 years. If you go up to like 476, you know, AD. So it's like a thousand years uh, that the Roman state is around. You also got the Byzantine Empire, which kept going afterwards. Uh, the Republic had different social classes. I think I've got a picture kind of showing you some of the different classes that they have uh, in Rome. The main ones they had of course, are the so-called, they got the, the so-called plebes and, of course, the patricians are the big groups uh, that you've got uh, that are real famous overall. The patricians are like the uh, aristocrats or nobility. Uh, these are the ones that were descended back to supposedly Romulus and Remus. 
Uh, in fact, the word patrician evolved from the word pater, it's the word father. So the fathers of Rome, I guess you want to call it that. Uh, I think even some thought they were descended from Aeneas uh, and all that. Then your plebes are like your common people uh, that are not nobility aristocrats. They make up a majority of the people. Uh, they make up a majority of the people in the Roman armies and things like that, uh, of course, also later. Uh, most of your patricians were usually from the senator, senatorial class or senators uh, that control the Roman Senate uh, and all that. But they were a group called the, uh, they had other ones too. They had two, like the, um, they had the equestrian class, you know, about the, them, which was kind of like this uh, middle class, upper middle class that was kind of between the patricians and the plebes. Uh, and they came out of the Roman cavalry. They were called equits or knights or something like that, usually. Uh, women could be in any class. They could be, you know, patrician, plebeian or whatever, but uh, they were obviously not equal to men. Uh, women didn't really not have a whole lot of rights on the Romans. Uh, the father could basically decide who the daughter would marry. And if for some reason he didn't like the, the son-in-law anymore, he could force her to divorce him and things like that. So uh, the father had a lot of power. They always talk about the power of familia, the fact that the father was the head of the household, uh, things like that. That's something that's declining today, which is kind of a problem in the West, uh, if you know about that, which is why marriage is declining. But um, anyway, um, then you got slaves, you know, slaves uh, made up, you know, um, most of the population, a good, good chunk, like a third to a fourth of the population. Uh, and uh, that was due to all of Rome's conquest. They conquered so much territory. Uh, they made people into slaves. Uh, but the Romans had a lot of land and plantations, which they needed slave labor for, especially for exported goods and things like that uh, overall. Uh, also, a few other things you can see. The Roman state uh, was made up of different assemblies. Uh, the Romans didn't just have one assembly. They had many different assemblies. They had like four or five different assemblies that they had at one point. Uh, the most famous, you know, is the Roman Senate, uh, which is mostly the Senate the assembly that was for predominantly uh, the upper classes, like the wealthy people, aristocrats and things like that. Uh, and they controlled a lot of the government. Uh, they deliberated a lot and advised pretty much uh, magistrates and emperors later. Uh, first, I think they're appointed by like, I think the censor or something like that, I think originally. Uh, but later on, the emperor appoints a lot of the Roman senators. It depends on how what time period you're in. They might have 300, they might have more, uh, depending on the time period historically. Plebeian consul uh, was the one for the plebes. So the plebes had their own assembly, uh, which was called different names. People's, I think, consul, I think was another name, or popular, the popular consul, or popular assembly was also called as well. The tribal consul for all the different Roman tribes they had uh, as well. And the military had a had assembly too, called the centuriate consul. Actually, the Romans uh, would actually call their um, assemblies, they would call it a comitia. I don't know if you know that or not, uh, comitia. Uh, it's where you get the word committee from originally. Uh, so that's just the Roman word for a consul or a s assembly, which I think the Greeks had called it bole, B-O-U-L-E or something like that uh, a long time ago. Also, under the Republic and later under the Empire, they had magistrates that would run the Roman government like you saw in Greece, like archons or whatever uh, they had in Greece uh, overall. You can see there's kind of a list of them going from up to down. You see there uh, the ones at the top, you know, are the most important ones overall. The Roman consuls, they had two of these that they had, uh, which there were actually age limits uh, to become a Roman consul. The average age uh, of a Roman consul uh, varied, but I believe for a plebe, you had to be 42, and a patrician, you had to be 40 uh, to, to be elected to it. Uh, they actually ran the army, so they would lead troops in battle as generals. Uh, they governed the affairs of the state, uh, kind of like a president, and they had veto power. Uh, so the Roman consul was pretty important. They usually served one-year terms, by the way, both of them kind of like on a ticket, like two of them. They run together, usually on a ticket, like a president, vice president, by the way, when they'll be elected. And um, 
Below them is what they call a praetor. The praetor was like um, more dealt with Roman law. These are the lawyers and judges uh, of the Roman law system, court systems, things like that. There's about eight of those you can see. They're easily elected. Um, you can see they also can act as governors, like prefect, prefects uh, and proconsuls and things like that throughout the republic and empire. Adels, uh, Adels were basically these uh, government officials that dealt with public um, affairs. Like They're the ones that uh, maintained the public buildings. Uh, they ran the public games. Like if you ever wonder who ran like the Colosseum, Circus Maximus, things like that. Uh, they're the ones that basically to maintain the roads and things like that. Uh, the Quaestor uh, was the ones that dealt with like financial matters, like the Roman treasury, uh, things like that. And uh, you can see as they go from top to down, uh, you can see uh, these are like the top like the top two are kind of like higher magistrates. And then these are kind of like lower magistrates, which are right here. Uh, most of these were open to patricians predominantly. Uh, tribunes were uh, representatives of the plebeians. Uh, so about 10 of those were usually elected uh, to power overall. They had veto power too, uh, just like the Roman consuls did. And, um, so it's kind of equal to, I guess, somewhat like the praetors and the consuls they had. Uh, and then everybody else didn't really have a lot of rights. Usually with the plebes, uh, if you study about it, Pradami was the more wealthy plebes that had any kind of power. Uh, most everybody else was kind of didn't have much, uh, if you think about that. <clears throat> but um, they had this thing called the cursus honorum. I did want to mention about which is very famous in Roman history, but uh, usually there was kind of a, a course you would take if you wanted to get to become like a Roman consul. You had to start on the bottom. So usually you would have to start with what they call military service, which I think minimum like maybe 10 years, <clears throat> maybe in the cavalry or whatever. Usually the nobility would go like me in the cavalry <clears throat> or if they were officers or whatever, but then you'd work your way up. Quaestor, Adel, Praetor, and then you'd reach Roman Consul if you got that far, of course. So, so that that's kind of traditionally how how most would would do that, starting on the bottom and work their way up. And they did this to give people not only you know experience politically or whatever, uh, but also military service, but also to I guess prevent any kind of corruption, things that might be there uh, as well. Tyranny, I guess, they're trying to stamp that out as well. All right. Um, now, in the Roman period, there was also this thing I'll kind of mention about that's kind of famous uh, about the Romans. Uh, you, you, you study about the um, there's a period under Roman history that's called the conflict or the struggle of the orders, which lasted for a couple centuries or so. You know, there was a period where the plebes and the patricians fought it out politically and socially uh, to control Rome. Uh, and um, I think at one point the plebes, even starting in the 5th century, went on strike, so-called plebe strike. Uh, they refused to serve in the, you know, the Roman army. And uh, it's almost like open warfare between these social classes. And so over time, it caused the plebes to gain more power. Uh, so uh, they, you know, got their own assemblies. Uh, they got their own magistrates, like the plebeian tribunes I mentioned before, about that. Uh, there was even like a deal where they kind of desegregated the social classes. Uh, they could even intermarry. I think previously a plebe couldn't marry a patrician on uh, things like that. And so you start seeing that, of course, occurring. Uh, oh, they think the struggle then led to the development of the Romans, uh, like the Republic's constitution, like their law codes, uh, you know, and their court systems, things like that would kind of come out later. Uh, because of this political struggle uh, between the two. And uh, in around 450 BC, uh, the Romans wrote down what became known as the 12 tables. Um, it's really 12 tablets, what it really means. Uh, but it was like the early law codes of Rome written on 12 tablets that basically made up what became the foundation of Roman law. Uh, it also you know, said who was a Roman citizen 
what their rights were. Uh, also, and also supposedly the 12 tables was also able to settle disputes, you know, between, you know, patricians of plebes. And, um, you know, I hear about the play, like when you get to like the empire, there's not as much stuff about the different social classes. I think you kind of get them merging a little together uh, over time. Uh, but it's a big thing, you know, kind of the Republic, the different social classes that are pretty much there. Uh, R Rome itself, by the way, you know, if you know about the story about this, wasn't built in a day. Uh, of course, there's the Palatine Hill uh, that you're looking at right there uh, from the Roman Forum. I think you can see that it's kind of like some of the early palaces that were built uh, going back to the so-called uh, Julio-Claudian dynasty, you know, the time of Tiberius and Caligula. I think Augustus Palace was kind of in the same area uh, that you're looking at, which I don't think that exists anymore. But um, anyway, uh, of course, one thing that's very famous, you know, the capital of Rome was based in the Roman Forum, uh, which that became the so-called civic center of Rome. So, you know, how we talked about how, you know, the, the Greeks had the Agora uh, they had with the, I guess Acropolis and all that. So Romans had something similar to that, which I think theirs was more like a large kind of town square civic center uh, that was there. And it was, of course, you know, dedicated to really the public, the public itself. Like it's a big, you know, giant public space uh, that's built there uh, for the people, which, like I said, was for pretty much anything. They had their temples there. Their main assemblies met there, markets, uh, local public baths. As you saw the video, entertainment, uh, the Roman Colosseum, Circus Maximus, you know, all within walking distance. Uh, what was that old saying about Rome? When you're in Rome, do the things that Romans do uh, in general. Uh, and so obviously, you know, different social classes could mingle with each other. That's, I guess, the thing that's familiar uh, with, with Rome. So you might have a deal where some wealthy person might run into it, obviously a poor person uh, also as well. Uh, they call it different names. Usually the people just call it the Forum, but sometimes they call it the Great Forum or Magnum Forum is a common name uh, that they often call it, which most of it's in ruins, which was from decay over time, from the empire decaying, and in a lot of wars where Rome was sacked multiple times, if you know about that. Well, like I said, Rome wasn't built in a day. It was like built by successive rulers you know, over time, and so was, so was the Roman Forum. Uh, also as well. Uh, and the Roman Forum um, is located, like I said, it's kind of like in a valley that's kind of between the Palatine and the Capitoline Hills. Uh, and um, supposedly, at least before the pandemic, I know four to five million people would often, you know, visit it uh, through, through that area, uh, the ruins of that, which are, I guess, kind of east. Of, it's east of the Tiber River is where it is. But um so anyway, yeah, that's the so-called Romans and the Roman Forum. But most, most, you know, Roman cities like throughout, you know, the Empire, Mediterranean Sea, had some kind of major city where they had some kind of civic center or forum that was part of it, uh, other, other, other culture. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, I've got a few minutes. I'm going to also move on today. I'm going to get in uh, and to kind of talk about as well another major event. Uh, that's also well known, of course, in Roman history, especially with the Roman Republic, which is the Punic Wars. Uh, we'll we'll get into that today. And I'll talk about the wars between you know Rome versus Carthage. Uh, it's a very very famous event, especially in Roman history. You know, because I think they say that really marks the beginning of Rome kind of moving on to uh, becoming more of a more of an empire. And um, Rome itself uh, in the fourth and third century expanded. So they went from this small kingdom based around the Tiber River. They took over the whole peninsula of Italy, absorbing the Greeks, Etruscans, and other tribes uh, that were also there uh, throughout Italy. And um, I've got a map showing you the differences between Rome uh, versus Carthage, uh, which is right here. You can see Rome's kind of, you know, right here. Uh, in this map uh, in the middle with Italy. You see Italy right here, uh, right? So Rome's kind of taken over by the fourth, fourth, third century, most of Italy. And then you can see uh, in North Africa, part of Spain, part of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, you've got this other 
state that emerges, uh, which, of course, is the so-called Carthaginian Empire. A lot of it is called Carthage for short, as you know, because of the famous city of Carthage that was located in North Africa, where Tunisia is today. And so you get this deal where you get these two superpowers, you know, that are left to fight it out. There's really not anybody that really can challenge all the Romans in, in the West uh, except Carthage. Uh, so you get these three series of wars that break out. They don't last that long. You can see 264 to 146, but they last over a period of 100-something years off and on. And uh, the Punic Wars were some of the bloodiest conflicts, by the way, in ancient times. It was pretty bloody. I don't, one quite two million. I think it was like 1.7 or 1.8 million were killed uh, in these wars. But you got to really go up to maybe the Middle Ages before you really got any wars that were pretty bloody. I think the Gaelic Wars, I know with Julius Caesar, was I think close to a million dead or something like that to kind of give you comparison uh, with that. Uh, but um, the Carthaginian Empire... I think I mentioned before, they were this multi-ethnic empire in North Africa that the Phoenicians founded back in the 9th, 9th century BC. Uh, they're mostly made up of North African peoples. And uh, they were founded by Queen Dido, who uh, was this Phoenician, kind of like a princess that came there and bought land uh, where Tunisia is now in North Africa. Uh, you know, the ruins of Carthage is at Tunis now. Uh, and uh, the Carthaginians were predominantly a trading empire. They were kind of like the Phoenicians. They were known for like maritime power, uh, trading goods uh, throughout the Mediterranean Sea. But they were also known for having um, a, a modern naval, like a good, a good, good naval power uh, throughout that time. They were better than the Romans. And uh, the Romans, like I said, were more of a representative democracy, whereas the uh, Carthaginians were more of a, a oligarchy. Uh, controlled by mostly aristocrats that were, I guess, controlled the government and the economy and all that. Why do they call it Punic Wars? Well, the Romans used to call uh, the call them the Carthaginians by their old name Phoenician, which the, the different words for it you can see there. Punicus, I think, is the Latin word uh, for Phoenician, and then you got the word Punici uh, is the Greek word, and so that's the origin of where the the word Punic comes from. So. The Punic Wars means basically uh, the Phoenician Wars. So I guess they knew they were descended from, you know, the Phoenicians, but not all the Carthaginians were, you know, Ph Phoenician. I think just a small, I think a lot of the aristocrats may have been descended, not only from the Phoenicians, but they are made up of all kinds of peoples, Libyans, Namidians, Africans, um, Spanish peoples. And I think some people in Gaul, in Italy, kind of joined up with the empire as well. So like the Romans, they become like this multi-ethnic empire uh, that they have. Uh, there are different writers that write about the Punic Wars. I mentioned some of them already. The main one that's famous today is the writer Levy, uh, who wrote The War with Hannibal. You've heard of like that, that part of the book of the history of Rome. Uh, that part's the most famous part, really, of his series of books on Rome. Uh, Polybius, by the way, I believe is uh, another writer, uh, I think it was Greek, uh, wrote a series of books that are called The History of Polybius. Uh, it was written kind of sometime after the Punic Wars. It's considered one of the best works ever written about the Punic Wars. Uh, and so we get a lot of the main original sources from him. Uh, so he's very, very important uh, for the sources on the Punic Wars. Apian was another writer, uh, Roman writer, uh, who's living around the time of like uh, the period of the five good emperors, which is that second century AD Roman Empire. He's got a book called Roman History, which is written later. It's kind of popular as well, but it's not as probably as good as Levy and Polybius. Uh, I think Levy's more romanticized, you know, if you know about that, but pretty much you get the whole Punic Wars from the Roman perspective because the Carthaginians, you know, lost all three wars and their people were wiped out. You know, their culture, their civilization was pretty much destroyed uh, after that. I'll kind of go into some of the Punic Wars. They probably won't be able to finish it, but I'll kind of get into and talk about, you know, some of the actual, uh, you know, conflicts with it. Here's kind of a map showing you, by the way, Carthage right here, uh, which I guess that's an old map of Carthage, which I'm not sure if that's the Carthaginian one or the Roman one, because there's a 
Carthage, they actually see of Carthage later, but the Romans have. But um, supposedly they had two ports, one for the Navy and one for the maritime fleet that they had. But it was supposedly a massive city, which I think by the time of like Hannibal and after that, they had maybe half a million people that actually lived there. So they say that the city of Carthage was actually, I think, double the size of Rome uh, during the Punic Wars. So it was a much, much bigger city uh, than the Roman city. But like I said, it would later get sacked by the Romans and destroyed. And so like the original ruins of, of Carthage are not much there anymore, a uh, long time ago. Now, uh, they had, like I said, multiple wars that would break out uh, in the wars. Like I said, the wars lasted 264 uh, to 146. Here, here's a here's a kind of a slide showing you the different wars they had. Uh, you've got first Punic War, 264, 241. Second Punic War, 218 to 202 about. Uh, third Punic War, 149 to 146. So um, really the second one is the most famous. They call it sometimes the, Hann the Hannibal War or War of Hannibal, the bloodiest one of the three. And um, so we'll get more into that a little today, maybe if I have time. But first Punic War, I'll talk about first about that one. Uh, that, that particular war uh, was more of a war which was fought over um, – what is really Sicily. Sicily was one of the main, um, I guess, geographic, you know, uh, things that both the two states fought for control of. Uh, Rome wanted basically uh, to control Sicily so that they could probably get into Africa. Also, Sicily was a bread basket. Uh, they grow a lot of crops there. Carthage wanted to take Sicily so that they could maybe attack and take over Italy as well. So you got these two kind of vying for control. Obviously from Sicily, you could have some kind of naval power uh, that was there. Most of the conflict was fought in Sicily and also in North Africa because, you know, the Romans tried to invade uh, the Carthaginian Empire in North Africa. And uh, so you even had naval campaigns that were kind of famous in the war where Rome actually developed like some kind of naval power uh, in the war. And uh, part of why the Romans won the first war, the first Punic War, was because the Romans were able to destroy most of the Carthaginians' naval power. Uh, and so after that, the Romans were then really able to take control of Sicily. And then from there, uh, from that map there, they would actually take over later Corsica and Sardinia. I think those were considered the first areas that the Romans would conquer outside of the Italian peninsula, uh, which most of those are now part of, you know, uh, Republic of Italy minus Corsica, which is part of France. So uh, anyway, I kind of just talk about that a little. I don't usually go much into the First Punic War, uh, but I will talk about the little bit about the Second Punic War, which is really more famous uh, today. Uh, and um, the, the Second Punic War, kind of get into that, uh, how it kind of, what caused it in general. Uh, the um, Carthaginians had this general named Hamilcar Barca. He had fought in the First Punic War. He's really considered their best general early on uh, in the Punic Wars. And he, what he did was he took his, some of his forces and crossed the Mediterranean Sea into Spain, which back then they called Spain different names. Iberia was a common name, which is where you get the term Iberian Peninsula. And the Romans they called Hispania, you know, but where you get the word Hispanic from. Uh, and uh, anyway, he, uh, the Barsids were a, a very wealthy nobility, like a noble family of, of Rome. They're called the Barsids. And um, it was like a bunch of, I'll kind of put them on the screen there, but Hamilcar, you had him, the, the patriarch, I guess, of the family. You had Hannibal, of course, the most famous, his main oldest son. Uh, you had, and Hannibal had two brothers, Hasdrubal and Mago, uh, that were well known. Uh, they're all like generals uh, that were real, real famous and fought at one point, point against the Romans. Uh, and, of course, Hamilcar Barca, you know, uh, his main son, you know, Hannibal would be the most famous one. Well, there's a very, very famous story uh, where Hamilcar made um, Hann Hannibal swear, like some kind of oath, that he would always uh, never be a friend he would always be an enemy to the Romans. Uh, and so Hannibal, Hannibal, you know, was not known for 
you know, being one of the, the most famous enemies of Rome. He almost brought Rome to its, its knees. Uh, and Hannibal, Hannibal is very important. Hannibal, uh, if you know about this, was considered to be one of the greatest military geniuses in ancient times. I think he considered him to be the, one of the top five generals in ancient times. He's up there with Julius Caesar, uh, Alexander the Great, uh, Scipio Africanus, uh, et cetera. And they usually view him as the father of military strategy because he was one of the earliest, you know, um, generals that really started to use strategy on the battlefield. It wasn't just, you know, hit him up the middle, like, you know, football, something like running up, run up the middle, you know, with your running back. Uh, he, he tried to, you know, attack their, their flanks. He tried to encircle them. And so his idea of warfare was like chess, trying to get the men in the right spot to, to take out the enemy uh, and all that. But, yeah, yeah, uh, Hannibal's real important. Hannibal's the one that would help ignite uh, the so-called Second Punic War, which uh, you can see lasted a decade and a half in like the bloodiest conflict that they, they ever had. Uh, the Romans, by the way, feared Hannibal so much that they had a common saying that they used to say about it, which is Hannibal's at the gates. You may have heard of, heard of that famous quote. Kind of sends chills up your spine when you know when you say it, especially loud. And Romans were scared of this guy. He was like he was like their boogeyman, you know, the the the, the ghost in the closet, the the scary person under your bed, <laughs> that kind of thing when you were a kid. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think um, parents or or maybe their nursemaids or whatever would often tell children that if they were being bad, they would say Hannibal's at the gates. And they'd run off and go to bed. Uh, so that's 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 something that he's kind of well known for. Even when Hannibal was when, even when Hannibal was dead, uh, people still feared him because they thought there was going to be another like a Hannibal Part Two or another guy that would come back later, and of course you know do the same thing again. But uh, I'll kind of get into uh, and talk about why the uh, so-called Second Punic War broke. It broke out because of Spain, like the conflict in Spain, Hispania, uh, of course, uh, where. You had this deal where the Carthaginians, like I said, had taken over part of Spain, like the southern part mostly was taken over by the Carthaginians under Hamilcar and his relatives. Uh, and but they had these some of these cities like Saguntum that was on the east coast that had been founded by the Greeks. A lot of the Greeks were kind of allied with the Romans, and so this created a lot of conflicts. And so Hannibal, who had pretty much practically taken over uh, Spain at that point. Uh, decided that, that that should be, you know, under under Carthaginian rule. Uh, and so what happened was in the year 218, he uh, laid siege to it and sacked it, basically, the city of Secuntum. And so that's what sparked the war uh, between the Romans and, 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 of course, Carthaginian Second War. And uh, the Romans thought that Hannibal was just going to wait for them to come over and attack him and all that. But Hannibal decided, if you know about this, to go on the offensive. And so you can see there, uh, with Hannibal's route, which is in uh, that purple, uh, you can see there, not purple, it's actually the green right here. The, the green, you can see the movement, Hannibal's forces, he takes his forces, he marches them through um, like the east coast of Spain and through the Alps of northern France and Italy. And um, that's one of the most famous things that Hannibal is known for. He's famous for crossing the Alps. With a massive army, I think he had like I want to say fifty thousand or more troops originally. In the dead of winter, by the way, which is pretty amazing. They say he lost half his force trying to get through the Alps, <laughs> which is true. Brought infantry, cavalry, and he had war elephants. Uh, which, if you know about Hannibal, Hannibal was very famous for using elephants in battle. Uh, did it throughout the Second Punic War, which could be deadly, you know, against uh, the Romans. Pretty much just smash their forces and terrorize them, uh, and so a lot of his early battles it was kind of a kind of a it influenced a lot of his battles. But a lot of the Romans did not understand how to fight Hannibal and his tactics. Uh, they lost a lot of battles uh, because of that. And so what basically happened was Hannibal's force swept down into northern Italy and crushed a lot of the early Roman, Roman forces. Uh, the Battle of Trebia. Uh, the, battle, the Battle of Lake Trasimene, uh, 218-217. Uh, these were all battles where Hannibal's force just destroyed anything they put put in its way. 
uh, in northern Italy. And uh, there was this Roman consul uh, and politician named Fabius Maximus. He thought that this offensive battles where the Romans wanted to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hannibal, it's a bad idea. He thought they ought to do some kind of guerrilla warfare, like Indian tactics, hit-and-run type tactics instead. And he was made fun of. They called him Fabius the Delayer, is what they nicknamed him. Uh, and so um, what happened was the Romans decided that Fabius, we're not doing that. We're gonna we're gonna try to crush you know Hannibal's forces. Uh, and so what happened was the Romans amassed a huge army, 80, 90,000 troops. This is in 216 BC. And they decided they were gonna march on Hannibal, who had invaded down into the southern part of Italy, and it led to the Battle of Cannae, uh, which I'll talk about later uh, on, on Wednesday, but um, you can see here kind of the, the, the map that Hannibal takes uh, from northern Italy, marches down into southern Italy near the Adriatic Sea. He was trying to you know, reach the city of Rome, maybe try to take it or force them to capitulate uh, in the war. Uh, and it leads to a very uh, famous battle. Uh, those two are going to fight it out. Hannibal, uh, of course, versus Rome. Uh, and the Romans get crushed. We'll, we'll see. They, they get beat badly uh, in this battle. Battle of Candy is considered to be Hannibal's greatest victory uh, pretty much of all time. Uh, that he had. But Hannibal is not going to be able to defeat the Romans. Uh, it's going to be a very bloody draw uh, between the, the, the Romans and the Carthaginians. Uh, but it obviously plays a major role in uh, the outcome of the war, of course, later. So I'll talk about later. Uh, pretty much that's it for my lecture, part one, of course, on ancient Rome. Uh, of course, on, on Wednesday's class, I'll have the part two lecture. It will be mostly on, I'm going to cover, of course, the rest of the Roman Republic. Uh, of course, I'll talk about the end of the Punic Wars. And I'll discuss how the Roman Empire, which is the Republic at the time, expands throughout the Mediterranean Basin, I'll talk about the rise of all these dictators that take over Rome. We'll talk about, you know, Sola and Marius. Uh, we'll talk about the rise of Julius Caesar in the first triumvirate. Uh, I'll talk about the second triumvirate uh, they have later, the rise of Octavian. Uh, so we're, we'll get more into getting into uh, the Roman Empire, its beginnings uh, by the time of the second, first century uh, BC. So it looks like we don't have any questions today. Uh, overall. Uh, but like I said, uh, I will see you later, of course, on Wednesday. Uh, reminder before I go, uh, don't forget, you do have assignments still up. India quiz, of course, Phoenicians, Israelites quiz. I will keep that up for you. Uh, of course, you want to, you know, uh, get that finished. If you haven't done that, of course, by the night, uh, those try to get it wrapped up. Second exam, of course, will be pretty much due coming up this next coming weekend. Uh, so try to get that done. That's on the Greeks, Alexander the Great lectures. Uh, so, yeah, we don't have far to go, you know. So we're pretty much uh, running out of days. Uh, this is week six, so week seven next week. We don't have any lectures in week eight. That'll be, of course, y'all's final exam coming up, which probably is going to be mostly on the Middle Ages. So that's it for today. If you have any uh, comments, questions, you know, please let me know, of course, later. Of course, like I said, on my YouTube channel. By the way, yeah, I hope you have a great day uh, also. Hey, Madison, hope you have a great day. And also, of course, Nadia uh, also as well. So y'all take care. And of course, I'll see you later, of course, in the week.